You know, it's easy to it's easy to look at Jacob and uh, and be critical critical of his choices, uh, his ever present will, and uh, and I, I may have been guilty from time to time this this weekend from using the pronoun you during these talks, but it's always been myself and not to you, really, that I'm, that I'm speaking and that I'm warning. I'm trying to use the biblical lens of Jacob's life to see in myself a similar spirit and to find a lesson and to learn the truth of his experience. And however critical I may have been, I've never really lost sight of the central truth of God's testimony of Jacob, which is found in in Hebrews chapter 11, which really speaking of of all the patriarchs, says there in Hebrews chapter 11 and, and beginning at verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And if truly they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly country. Wherefore? God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And there's a simple truth in this passage. Jacob was persuaded of the promises. Jacob embraced the promises. Jacob confessed that he was a stranger in the land of promise. Jacob desired a better country. God is not ashamed to be called Jacob's God. In fact, the God of Jacob shows up no less than 25 times in Scripture. The first time in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, where it says, And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. This is the first usage of the term, which is in fact echoed in the New Testament in Matthew and in Acts. But notice some of these Psalms that mention the God of Jacob. Psalm 20 and verse 1. Yahweh will hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. From the reading today, Psalm 46, verse 7. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Psalm 84 and verse 8. O Yahweh, God of armies, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold, O God, our shield. Look upon the face of thine anointed. Psalm 146 and verse 5. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in Yahweh his God. Consider just the admonition of these four passages. The God of Jacob defends in the day of trouble. The God of Jacob is with you. The God of Jacob is a refuge. The God of Jacob is a shield. The God of Jacob is he that helps. How do we know this to be true? Because Jacob faced the day of trouble. Jacob required refuge. Jacob needed a shield. Jacob learned to hope in Yahweh his God. The life of Jacob is a testimony to the quality of God. 
to the character of God. God lifts up Jacob and says, how do you know how I am? Because look how I've acted with this man. That's how you know what kind of God I am. How did I act with Jacob? That is the character and the testimony of me. And so given the overwhelming witness of Scripture that God is named time and again the God of Jacob, we need to take care before we criticize this man. This man was a man God loved. This is a man that God chose. Consider for a moment that Jacob was in fact the epitome of God's election, of God's choosing. We know this because of Romans chapter 9. You might want to turn over there. Romans chapter 9. Now look at verse 6, and then we'll read from there, jump to verse 11 to 13. Romans chapter 9 and verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What's Richard, what is Scripture really saying to us here? Saying two truths at the same time. Firstly, that God elects who are his, that his election, it's his election, it's not according to hereditary descent, because if it was according to hereditary descent, of course, Esau would be uh, elected, or be chosen. He's also saying it's not according to works, but we're tempted to say, how, how is it not according to works? Because we look at the works of Jacob and sometimes we can, we can puzzle. I mean, of all men of Scripture, of the many men that, that, that displayed ample faith, why Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, the father of the tribes, why Jacob? And about Jacob, Romans says this, in chapter 9 and verse 6, it says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. I think it's actually maybe helpful to put that in the positive rather than in the negative. In the positive, it would read, On the elect, the word of God hath taken effect. On Jacob, Despite what we might perceive of his fears or his desires, the testimony of Scripture is that the word of God had an effect on that man. That God knew it would, and that God knew it would not on his brother Esau. So it's plain that God loved that man, that God chose that man, notwithstanding the testimony of Scripture to his shortcomings. In fact, Scripture is almost as emphatic that God chose Jacob. The, the idea that God chose Jacob shows up in no less than seven Scriptures. Amongst these are Psalm 105, verse 6. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. Or Psalm 135, verse 4. The Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Or, or Isaiah 41, and verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Or Isaiah 44, verses 1 and 2. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith Yahweh that made thee, that formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. The fact that God chose Jacob, 
is designed by God to be a source of comfort. He is God's peculiar treasure, his chosen, meaning that we ought not fear. The undeniable message of Scripture is that God chose this man, and God is happy to be called the God of this man. Why? Because on him, the word of God had effect. God has not judged him according to his works, according to his errors or failings. God has chosen him to show the quality of his character. Yahweh is the one that defends and helps. Yahweh is the one who keeps his promise to the one who struggles yet loves his word. That the man who loves the word of God is a treasure unto Yahweh. He ought not fear. How do we know? The same way the writers of the Psalms were inspired to write. Because the life of Jacob proves it to be so. Does not the life of Jacob give hope to those of us that struggle? Does not his life testify to those that have strong desires only to find out that the desires don't satisfy? Does he not witness to those who have fears only to realize their fears are nothing? Does he not speak to those who have gone into mourning only to realize that God is faithful? Are we not to learn that even if we strive with God, that God can strive for us? Is not that the witness of this man? Is he not a witness of those of us who are weak? Is he not a witness of those of us who who honestly, brothers and sisters, to those of us who love God's word and fail, to those who love God's word and are weak, to those who love God's word and have fears, to those who love God's word and struggle, is he not a witness to us? Does he not a witness to us that God will love and be a refuge to us, that we need not fear? Is he not a witness to the character of God Is not Jacob that witness to us? Does the life of Jacob not confess to us as declares the Psalms to the character of God? How do we know the character of God? Look how he was with Jacob. That is proof and as witness to God's character. And so God makes him the father of the tribes. To those that strive with God, and for those on behalf of whom God strives. But for all that, we have not yet considered Jacob's great act of faith. For Hebrews will go on to tell us in in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 21, about the witness of Jacob's faith. It's a curious verse when we first come across it, when perhaps we compare it to some of the faithful witness of the others written down here in this chapter of the faithful. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21, the the author, probably the Apostle Paul, inspired by God, writes this as the pinnacle of Jacob's faith. By faith, Jacob, verse 21, when he was a dying blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped upon the top of his staff, or leaning upon the top of his staff. And of course, you ask and I ask, how was blessing the sons of Jacob, excuse me, how is blessing the sons of Joseph a great act of faith? 
The details we read as our opening scripture in preparation of exhortation this morning, they are essentially these. Joseph hears that Jacob is dying and comes to see him with his sons. Now Jacob's vision is failing, and Joseph carefully guides his older son Manasseh to Jacob's right hand, and his younger son Ephraim to Jacob's left hand. And quite intentionally, Jacob crosses his hands to put his right hand on the head of Ephraim and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, saying that the younger will truly be the greater and his seed will become a multitude of nations. So where is the great act of faith in doing so? Where is the great act of faith? I think we first need to consider for a moment some of the obvious things. Someone came up to me and says, Ben, I love how you do Bible study. You just point out the obvious. They're so true. That's that's basically all I do. Um, So so, so let's let's point out the obvious. Whose sons were these? These were Joseph's sons. Now, we've considered the way that Israel felt about his son Joseph. Uh, Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. Uh, Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. So taking that as maybe an emotional backstop for the story, Joseph's intention in coming to Jacob was to receive the birthright. He was to receive a double portion of the inheritance of his brothers, and as a result, his two sons will be counted as sons of Jacob, thereby securing twice the inheritance as Joseph's brothers. And these two, of these two, he wanted Manasseh, his eldest, to be blessed as the greater. This was his will, and this is why he brought them to Jacob. But Jacob doesn't do as Joseph willed. Instead, he crosses his hand, placing his right hand on the head of the younger, and Joseph is upset about this. And we read in Genesis chapter 48, in verse 17 to 18, And Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim. It displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from the head head of Ephraim and to put it onto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. Now the record says it displeased him. That's actually quite a strong word. This word displeased is the same word that's translated when Abraham saw that Ishmael need to be banished from his camp, it says it displeased Abraham. It's a word for when Saul heard that David has slain 10,000 and Saul has only slain thousands, that displeased Saul. It's the word for when Jonah is given word that God has spared Nineveh and it displeased Jonah. It's a strong word. It's a strong feeling that boiled up within the chest and the hearts of of Joseph when he saw this. So Jacob, in his dying days, sees his beloved son, the son who he says he hadn't even hoped to see him again, let alone to see see his children. And Jacob does something that quite intentionally displeases Joseph. Do you think that's a simple matter? Knowing what you know of Jacob, do you think that that was a simple matter? you think it was done lightly? Consider for a moment Isaac. Isaac favored Esau. And Isaac, when his eyes were dim, intentionally goes and tries to pass on 
the blessing to Esau that he would be greater than his son Jacob. So Jacob now felt a similar pressure. He is in front of his beloved son. But he acts differently. He doesn't do what his heart tells him to do. He does not give Joseph what Joseph wants. Jacob's response is found in Genesis chapter 48, verse 19. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I I know it. He shall become a people, and he shall also be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. It's like he's saying, Joseph, Joseph, it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how I feel. Or that you're upset, or that I'm upset, or what you want and strive for, or what I want and strive for, or how the boys strive with one another. Joseph, these things exist to be sure, and I know them. I know them. I know them. I know it, Joseph. I've lived it. In the Hebrew, you only say the same word twice when you want to add special emphasis. So the special emphasis in this verse is, I know it. I know how you feel. I really know how you feel. But the inference is that feelings are not important in light of the revealed will of God, which Jacob comes to say, I accept and I obey. I know how you feel. I especially know it. But this is what God has revealed to me. And it will come to pass. And if it upsets you, well, it upsets you. Do you see why that for Jacob, for for Jacob, is a poignant act of faith? Can you see it? But look at what Jacob says in giving the blessing in, in, in verse 15 of chapter 48, Genesis. And he blessed Joseph and he said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now remember the prayer that Jacob had prayed at Bethel, the vow he had made. And it says in Genesis 28, verse 20, we've considered this, and Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again into my father's house in peace, then shall Yahweh be my God. Jacob has striven his whole life. He strove in the house of Laban. He lost sleep. He fought beast. He endured wage manipulation. He pacified Esau. He mourned without comfort. He faced the famine. He risked sending Benjamin. 
Jacob who had done this, and Jacob who had done that, and Jacob who had done this, and Jacob who had done that. And actually, at the end of his life, in Jacob's own final analyses, Jacob says, God fed me my entire life. And so if that's true, if he says, God fed me my entire life, I want you just to consider for a moment, in light of the vow, the significance of that final famine. Jacob had vowed and asked God to give him bread to eat. That this was somehow a test of God's faithfulness. So what does God do at the end of Jacob's life? God prepares a famine. God, if you feed me, you'll be my God. God. Well, let's just test this, shall we? I am going to send you a famine so grievous that you are going to be faced with the real prospect of starvation. You are going to be faced with the desolation of your flocks. You're going to be faced with the starvation of your family. Such that if I don't intervene, all will be lost. So I'm going to prepare a famine, Jacob. Do you think that, that more than once during the famine, Jacob just might have thought back to that vow to God? Would God fulfill the vow? Would God be faithful? He was desperate. He was hungry. His household was hungry. His flocks assuredly were dying because what pasture land could there have been to support so many thousands of animals? Pushed to the brink of hopelessness by famine, and only because of the hopelessness of it all, he sends Benjamin to Egypt. Where was God now? Where was the God that said that he would feed me? Where was the God that said he would be with me wherever I would go? Where is that God? So with great reluctance, he sent the boy, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. I want you to notice the significance of this. Benjamin goes away into Egypt. And what does he bring back with him? Genesis chapter 45, verses 22 and 23. To all of them he gave each man a change of raiment. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver, five changes of raiment. And, his father, and to his father he sent after this manner, ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt, and ten she-asses, laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So Benjamin returns in peace to the house of his father carrying what? Food and clothing. It's as if Joseph knew the vow his father has made and was going out of his way to show how God had abundantly fulfilled and was faithful. And so with that in mind, Jacob leans on his staff, not on his own understanding. He leans on his staff. that had been his sole possession when he crossed Jordan in distress. 
going to Laban, and he says, really, truly, honestly, God fed me all my days. The angel redeemed me from all evil. Amen, Jacob. And it wasn't until he was hungry and desperate and forlorn and needed to act with faith and place hope against hope that he ever learned the truth of it. God had brought him back via the famine, circumstantially to Bethel. So he could show how faithful he was to the vow of Bethel. Brothers and sisters, will it be true for us as we strive and want and fear and fight through the evil days? Will it be that God will bring us to the point of desperation only then to teach us that he is faithful? Will our great act of faith be needing to wait on God when we have no other option but to wait on God to show mercy and to do justly? Jacob had prayed for food and clothing, but for one other thing, that he be brought back to his father's house in peace. And so it should be no surprise that Jacob says, to his sons in Genesis 49, verse 29, and he charged them, and he said to them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. For there they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. And there they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into his bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. So Jacob made one last request of his sons to return to his father's house in peace. He would not be buried in the land of Egypt, but in the land of the promise that he saw far off, that he confessed, and that he embraced. He would be gathered into his people, into the land of his inheritance, in peace. And returning unto the house of his father to be buried alongside Leah, Rebekah, Isaac, Sarah, and Abraham in a cave, he waits. He waits, brothers and sisters. He waits to this day. He waits continually. He waits for salvation. We began the study then, as we conclude, we began the study in Genesis 49. And I point you out to a curious verse. It comes between the blessing of Dan, right after the blessing of Dan. So reading then, and I I said it almost appears as if a non sequitur, as if it appears out of sequence. So Jacob says in Genesis chapter 49, and starting at verse 17. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path, that biteth the horse's heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Yahweh. I can see that as Jacob delivers this prophecy, blessing to Dan that within it he couldn't help but see the curse of Genesis 3. See, the serpent shall bite the heel. Now, what happens when you have a horse is you feel secure from serpents, don't you? You think, nope, 
The serpents are on the ground. I'm secure. I, I, I'm on the horse. And what happens is the serpent bites the horse. And the horse rear the horse rears up. And all of a sudden, the rider of the horse is thrown backwards. And there's that moment to those of us that fall down a lot, we're familiar with this feeling. I'm familiar with this feeling of I know I have lost complete control, but I haven't hit the ground yet. And I'm at total and complete mercy to the forces of nature. So Jacob pauses, and I think he can see his own life under the light of the curse of sin. And as much care as he had taken to mount his horse and to overcome these things, he was not able to overcome them. And he realizes that he is in the midst of falling backwards, that he cannot save himself. So he cannot help himself but to admit in the midst of blessing his sons, I have waited for thy salvation, O Yahweh. I am helpless to save myself in the midst of the wretchedness of this curse. And so are we, brothers and sisters. We are like those bidden by the serpent, falling backwards, knowing the inevitability of the fall, unable to help ourselves, unable to control the fall. And in that moment, we can only say, I have waited for thy salvation because there is no other. Hebrews chapter 11 says, And these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Surrender, brothers and sisters. It's simply this. In all of Jacob's striving and wrestling, he realized that in the end, his only hope, his only salvation was in Yahweh. But it was only a lesson he truly learned when he let go. When he let go and he trusted God, when he leaned on his staff rather than his own understanding, when he sought first for God's will, not pleasing himself, not pleasing Joseph, not yielding to his feelings nor those of his beloved, but to God's will, because his will will be done. Can we learn to do this? Can we let go of blame? justifying our sins? Can we let go of injustice to get what we want and keep judgment? Can we trust that God will feed us? He will clothe us and seek first the kingdom in the present to do what's right in the moment And as far as how things turn out, brothers and sisters, 
for that. Let us wait continually on our God. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof.